you can flag reviews and hope Google will take them down, but by hosting a third party review on your website that you don't have control over, it's actually giving people a little bit more social proof and it's giving them a little more security about the purchase that they're helping. Hey everyone, this is Nazar Akio from Max Pro. Hi, I'm Linda. And I'm Paul. And we're Love and Pebbles. Hi, this is Lopa Vandermersch from Rasa. Oh, you're listening to, and you're listening, and you are listening to the e Harm Show. Welcome to the Ecom Show, presented by Blue Tusker, the number one place to hear the inside scoop from other e commerce experts where they share their secrets on how they scaled their business and are now living the dream. Now, here is your host, Andrew Math. I'm your host, Andrew Maftone, and today I'm going to be talking about the many, many things that you can use as gated content. So yesterday, obviously, I went over uh, a lot of things on how to create content and how to basically take a video and make it last you for weeks on end. And then obviously, if you're growing this content, the next goal should be to start to build that lead list or your sales. And the most important thing, second most important KPI is emails. You will hear me say that a lot. Um, so what I wanted to do is kind of go over a list of gated content that I've done over the years. Um, mainly because there's so many times where even I'll sit down and I'll go, man, I've done all this gated content, but I can't think about what to do for so-and-so. And, -so. and it, it's just daunting. So it, I always forget stuff. I've definitely worked with people before where they're like, I can't think of what to set up for gated content. And so I'm going to go over some things that are very common. I'm going to go over some things that are a little bit different. Um, and I will try to uh, go through the level of difficulty of, of actually getting them done as well too. Uh, so the first one I wanted to mention was um, doing a calculator or a quiz. So this is more of an interactive gated content, right? So it kind of requires someone to interact with said gated content in order to get their email. Um, the, we've all done the calculators, we've all done the quizzes. Uh, like it, honestly, the, you've probably come across the Disney princess one on Facebook where they ask you like what Disney princess you are. Um, side note, I'm an Ariel. Uh, but uh, so they've done, those have done amazing. Um, it depends on who your clientele is. So the calculators work really well. If you're working with e-commerce sellers who don't know what the lifetime value of their their customer is and you just create a, cal a calculator that they give you an email and then they fill it out and obviously it works that way. Quizzes are always fun. Uh, it's interesting because you kind of want to go through there of like if you're depending on obviously who you're targeting, uh, if you're trying to find um, anyone with a website and you do a quiz of, you know, find out if your website is user friendly or not. And they just answer a bunch of questions, obviously give us your email and we'll send you the results and there's your gated content. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention, so this one I did a long time ago and it's one of the most successful I've ever had. And it was very easy to do. Uh, what I did is I created a, just a, basically a Google spreadsheet so it was live so that everyone could, as they accessed it, I was constantly updating it for them. And what I did was basically a live calendar. Um, at this time, I was uh, helping with an agency. They were targeting e-commerce sellers. And so what I did is I created a calendar of every e-commerce conference that was coming up along with every webinar that I got you know, sent for whatever email because those happen all the time. And I would sift through them and make sure they weren't crap and make sure that they actually belonged on there. Um, I had a VA help me out who would just be like, hey, so-and-so's date was just announced. Do you want me to add it to the calendar? That kind of thing. It was a great piece of, of uh, gated content. I got a ton of emails out of it. The conversion rate was amazing. And mainly because the thing that everyone liked about it was this isn't something that I'm going to download and then is going to get old. It's something that I'm going to download and it's going to constantly be updated. And if I'm like, hey, I need to go to a conference in July or, hey, I'm going to be in XO place in November. Let me see if there's something going on. Um, it was a great piece. I loved it. I've definitely started to try to leverage it more often. Uh, next one, similar to the live things, so live lists. Um, one that actually got me a couple weeks ago was a live um, uh, social media image size list. I'm always forgetting what the sizes are. My designers remember them. I don't remember them ever. <laughs> So when I saw like, oh, this one's uh, a Google Doc and it's constantly being updated. So if Instagram does something that again, then I can obviously see. I thought it was a great idea, but a live document done through Google is very easy to do. It's very simple and people love them because they don't have to like go back and redownload it or updated 2020, that kind of thing. So great way to actually pull in some more um, emails. 
what else did I have? Uh, there's some, there's some that are boring newsletters. Obviously, if you're doing a, a newsletter, um, you know, sign up, subscribe for a newsletter. The the problem is with newsletters, is that unless you have an amazing newsletter that people are talking about and they came to your site looking for your newsletter, it's very hard to get someone to do that. Depending on your industry, so tell me, e-commerce sellers, it's a lot easier. Um, but if you're a SaaS company or if you are, um, you know, selling some kind of service, it's a little bit more difficult because newsletters can be so spammy and kind of daunting. The only way I've seen those work the most is, uh, typically at, at minimum a weekly newsletter, uh, at most daily. Uh, I've seen the daily ones work very, very well. Keep them short, keep them sweet. I mean, you have morning brew, you have the click, you have, um, Daily Carnage, you have obviously Morning Brews, Marketing Brew, and Retail Brew, and all their other brews. Um, there are a ton of great daily newsletters that work very well that can obviously help for gated content. If you have the the ability to create a daily newsletter, it's not as easy as it sounds. I would say it's probably one of the more difficult things on here. Um, another one I had was chatbots. So chatbots are interesting. Um, I will definitely get into those one of these episodes. Uh, they can be more difficult um, to set up depending on, on your your um, expertise in it, obviously. Uh, but once they're set up, they're interesting. Facebook's got a lot of rules with it. It's still such a, a relatively newer technology that, you know, sometimes you can do this and sometimes you can't. And Facebook will tell you like, oh, you can't do that. And it becomes a pain in the ass. But essentially, they... I had another one a while ago where we set one up. It was a, a nice chat bot, walked through a great couple different flows. Obviously, if they became a lead, that was even better. Um, but one of the things that, that we did with that was the chat bot would then broadcast daily some kind of big news. Uh, we were using it kind of an, as a news outlet. And Facebook got a little cranky with uh, us constantly sending out messages every day. So it became a little bit more of a pain. And you could really say the same thing with SMS. So texting people at a certain point, it, it does become a little daunting to over to overshare and it can become spammy. But if it's executed correctly, they work great. Um, ones I hate, eBooks, white papers, uh, digital book, that kind of crap. I have downloaded more eBooks and white papers in my life than I care to share and I have probably read a tenth of them. Um, a lot of times I'll go, oh, that sounds like a good read, and I'll never read it. Uh, they're also, if they're done correctly, specifically ebooks or white papers need to be relatively lengthy and they need to have some nice design to them. So even if you're actually going through and you're spending the time writing and you're spending the time uh, designing it, it, it can be a, a bigger workload. But I've actually found that as time goes on, ebooks and white papers have been so overplayed that. Not many people want to download them anymore. Um, if anything, they're more, uh, to me, they're, they're, they work better if you just create an ebook and just send it out. So you got a, a, an email from a different piece of gated content, and then several weeks later, you just go, hey, we wrote this ebook. We thought you'd like it. Uh, for a piece of gated content, I'm finding them more and more to be a little bit more difficult, but that one is what it is. Uh, one page PDFs. So sometimes like infographics, things like that can do really well. Um, I think the best part about those is that it, it's just a one pager. It's simple. You download it, you read it, you get the information you want. Maybe it's something that someone wants to print and, and hang in their office or something, depending on what it is. But I find that the shorter form content when it comes to something like a PDF, where as opposed to like an ebook or white paper is much, much better for someone to consume. So it's kind of don't waste someone's time, provide as much value as you possibly can, and that kind of stuff will get downloaded a lot better than I've found with white papers and ebooks. Um, another one that I've started to do more recently, so social groups, LinkedIn group, Facebook group, hey, join our group, it's exclusive group, blah, blah, blah. Everyone kind of has one at this point, and they can get a little overwhelming as well because you end up in so many different groups and you're just like, I don't know what group this is anymore. There's too many people or there's too many groups. Well, this one's different. The, essentially, what I've started to do as opposed to, I, I just did a different platform. So what I'm trying to do now is a Slack community, and it's it, there's only a handful of them right now. And I'm actually pretty shocked at how good it's doing so far. I didn't expect it to do that well because I, even though Slack has God knows how many millions of users, um, I wasn't sure of, you know, not everyone has Slack. Some people have Microsoft Teams or something like that. But what I essentially did was I created a Slack community where 
you can't get in um, unless you apply. It goes through an application process, and then you do allow someone in. And then once they're in, there's further levels to it. So if you're not familiar with Slack, there's channels, and you can actually make some of those channels private. So we'll actually bring a community into one place, but then a small segment of those people will actually create a private channel, and those people will just keep their conversations there. So we've done it before um, with several different industries, and it's worked very well. It is probably one of the easier things to do on here simply because you're really just creating a Slack channel, I'm sorry, creating a Slack workspace, creating a, some kind of uh, landing page for it, um, creating however you're doing the gated content to get them to said landing page, and then you're really just putting everyone into a Slack workspace. Yes, you need to keep conversation going. Yes, you need to set up the channels and things like that, but outside of that, it's actually pretty easy to do. And then you have like the coaching guys. Um, so this is the last, last one that I was able to think of for this, this episode. Um, so the short one-on-one -on -one sessions, stuff like that. Obviously you can do other things like, oh, buy my book and all you have to do is pay for shipping. To me, that's still kind of ebooky. Um, but the one-on-one -on -one sessions I've seen work very well before too, where it's, hey, you know what? Uh, it works from what I've seen much better with someone who is teaching. So if it's uh, someone who's, you know, it's a marketing agency teaching other marketers or something like that. Um, but they'll do sign up and I'll do a 25 minute, you know, quick session with you and we'll walk through your Facebook ads or we'll walk through email campaigns or anything like that. Um, it can also work really well with SaaS companies. It's a great way for them for lead generation to kind of put them into a sales funnel. But, uh, I've seen those work really well too. And that is my list. So today, of course, I'm trying to feature a tool every week. And so, uh, this week I'm going to feature outgrow. Um, outgrow is really great with, uh, the gated calculators and quizzes and things like that, that I mentioned in the beginning. There's are super easy to use. If you've ever tried to make uh, a quiz yourself through type form, or if you've ever tried to create a calculator yourself through like Google sheets, it is a nightmare. Uh, unfortunately, year, years ago, we did try to do that and it was not worth it. Uh, but Outgrow has some great stuff you just embed into your into your website or you can send them to a landing page, things like that. But Outgrow is definitely something that I would suggest looking into if you're looking for new gated content ideas. Those are my favorite. And now, I know a lot of e-commerce sellers are a little bit more adamant to focusing on product reviews or site reviews on their actual website and don't really care about Google reviews. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm kind of referring to when you search your own business name and usually up on the right hand side, you'll see your listing for Google and it will have your reviews there. So I want to talk a little bit about the importance of those because I see a lot of people kind of steer away from them. Now with e-commerce, there's two different types of reviews. So you're going to have those and you're going to have the ones that live on your site. But there's also a weird third one that kind of ties in to the, the Google one, and that is the Google customer review. So this is something that you can actually submit for your store to go through. And what will happen is after checkout, these sellers, or I'm sorry, these uh, purchasers are going to get a review request from Google. It's not from you. They uh, basically randomly select people to leave a review based on the product that they purchased or how the site was and things like that. And it's a Google trusted review. So maybe sometimes you'll see on e-commerce sites, usually at the bottom left or in the bottom right, wherever you decide to put it, there's a little hover looking thing that is a Google trusted review. And those are reviews that came through Google's platform about your website. So it's a little bit more social proof for other people to see that there's a third party out there that is allowing other reviews. But between those types of reviews, there's several benefits to all of them. The biggest one is obviously on an SEO side. So Google has made it very clear that it indexes every piece of content on your website. That includes comments. That also includes blog comments, but it includes reviews or questions that people are leaving. So the more reviews and the more questions that you're getting are actually going to improve the SEO side. Um, now, looking at my notes here to make sure I don't miss anything, there's also a... Uh, user experience benefit behind it as well of the additional reviews and the additional stars. So as the stars start to fill up. So if you're connecting your reviews to Google Shopping or if you're ideally gaining those Google reviews through the Google My Business, then you're actually gaining more and more credibility. You're actually gaining a little bit of an extra real estate in each area that's going to showcase your business that much more. Now, 
The real benefit here, besides the SEO side and the, and the visual side, is the social proof side. People always want to make sure that they're not going to be the first one to try something. That's why when you first launch a business or you first launch a product, especially on Amazon, it's nearly impossible to get it going. It takes a very long time. You have to spend a lot of money, but it kind of has this snowball effect. And that's really because, obviously, over time, your pages will improve, but also your reviews will improve and your social proof will will improve, which will cause it to snowball. Um, so whether you're using uh, a software like Yapo, who will be um, the one that I decided to mention today, they tie in very well with Google Shopping as well as the um, <clears throat> like the search. So if you search your, your brand name on Google and you actually go to one of the organic searches and you see the little stars snippet underneath your meta title, that is something that can be connected through Yapo and things like that. Of course, they're going to set up those automated reviews, but those Google reviews are something that's completely different because the way the Google reviews are helping is they're not you controlling the reviews. You can respond to reviews, you can flag reviews and hope Google will take them down, but by hosting a third-party review on your website that you don't have control over, it's actually giving people a little bit more social proof and it's giving them a little more security about the purchase that they're helping. And Google does have some numbers out there about the improvement of on a conversion rate for having it. I don't know it off the top of my head. I would encourage you to go look it up. If I can find it, I'll put it in the show notes too. probably gonna get a little heated because this one this, this one pisses me off so i'm talking about the like super hyper ultra mega targeted keyword search query funneling that agencies brag about so obviously as an agency i will say that we do this and i will say that we don't have a fancy term for it we just call it our shopping campaign strategy um, but I've heard some ridiculous names for this, which honestly is the correct way to run Google Shopping ads. So you don't really need to give it a fancy name, but I digress. Um, so here's how this is done, right? So you're going to start with a high priority campaign and a medium priority campaign. Then you're going to take a product line that is very similar to itself. So you're not going to question the search terms that are showing up. So Again, I film a bunch of these at once, so my dog's just been laying there the whole time. So we're going to do dog toys. So I have golden retriever specific dog toys that I'm running, right? So I'm going to have a high priority and a medium priority campaign with all my specific golden retriever dog toys. So that when, when an ad shows up, or I'm sorry, when a search term shows up, I'll know these are all my golden retriever dog toys. If they're not searching something like that, it's not a keyword I want. So you have your high priority, medium priority. High priority's gotta have a decent budget. Doesn't have to be massive, but you're gonna get a lot of broad stuff. You're gonna get a lot of crap in there. This is where you're doing your discovery, your searching. Your medium priority, you're gonna have a little bit more success. So you're gonna have those bids a little bit higher and you're gonna wanna give some room on that budget. So basically what's gonna happen is, let's say um, we're doing uh, branded keywords. So. Andrew's dog toys probably isn't good because it's kind of a bad brand name. But let's let's say it's Blue Tusker, right? So we have Blue Tusker Golden Retriever dog toys. So if someone searches Blue Tusker dog toy, it's going to show up in my high priority. Priority. I'm going to negate that keyword, which will cause it to drop down into the medium priority. So now it's going to show up in the medium priority. So next time someone searches Blue Tusker dog toys, it's going to show up in the medium priority. I have that bid up higher now, so I'm going to start to own that keyword. As those start to do well, you're going to constantly just negate things out of the high priority. This is why your high priority, you're going to want to keep that budget relatively low and you're going to keep those bids relatively low because it can definitely get out of hand. And once you get it to running really, really well, you're going to want to keep that CPC as low as possible in the high priority because you're basically going to take all the good stuff and move it down into the medium priority. So now by then, all of your branded keywords are in the medium priority and all of your top performing keywords are in the medium priority. Then you're gonna replicate the same concept. So if it starts to do well in the medium priority, let's say you have some really better performing branded keywords and you have some really better performing just more general keywords and they do really well. You're gonna negate those and you're gonna drop those into a low priority. So usually what I'll do is I'll create a high and a medium priority and let it bake, get my data in. If you've ever done this before, and then after I've gotten my data, I'm ready for it, then I will create my low priority. 
That one, big budget, big bids, own these keywords. So this is basically that funnel concept that these agencies brag about. So you've basically gotten this keyword down to this low priority, you've jacked it up, and now you'll see over time in that low priority campaign, that's the only keyword that's in there. It's the only thing you're bidding on. So that's how they specifically bid on these one individual keywords. And as you just start to shove more and more keywords down into the funnel, it works down there. Um, so obviously the only other side of this is you need to make sure that you're always adjusting your day, time, state, audience, device, uh, all that stuff. You need to make sure that you're adjusting those bids. I like to do that on close to a monthly basis. It kind of depends on the size of the account. If I'm getting a ton of data, uh, often and we're spending a good amount of money. I'll usually do it every couple weeks, um, but usually slightly newer ones where they're spending like maybe 10K or less-ish a uh, month, I'll do it just once a month. Um, that's all I wanted to talk about today. Uh, and then I'm gonna feature Google Merchant Center just because I know it's kind of a tool. Uh, to me, it still counts as a tool. A lot of shopping ads, uh, people say that, oh, they don't work well for me. That's not true. They work well for all e-commerce sellers. You just have to really narrow down that uh, keyword that you're going after. But the one thing I've learned is that a lot of people will just shove their stuff into Merchant Center and let it go straight to ads and they don't optimize it at all. So you need to go into Merchant Center and set up reviews, uh, set up promotions if you can. If you offer free shipping, make sure that that's mentioned, but make sure that you optimize everything that you can in Merchant Center. So. Google search ads to drive uh, more leads and shoppers. So obviously I cater more to e-commerce. So leads in this case could be um, driving them to some kind of gated content. So maybe you did an ebook, which yes, you can for e-commerce, which I'll get to in another time. But so we're gonna go right into this. First thing I always fight, branded search terms. Absolutely bid on them. I don't care if none of your competitors are bidding on you. You always, you don't want to be surprised to find out that a competitor all of a sudden started bidding on you. You're going to pay arguably nothing per click. You're going to get a ridiculous conversion rate. The amount of money you're going to spend to pay for someone else to click on your own brand name is totally worth it. It's fine. So run a campaign for your own branded keywords. Um, so always test, right? Even your branded stuff. So even when you do different ad groups, you have different keywords, you have different copy that you're using, different description, different title, all that fun stuff, different landing page, test all that stuff. So in, um, uh, what is it called? Drafts and experiments, set that up. Always run A-B tests, set it up so that once one is determined, let it run. I probably set up a test on a usually about a weekly basis, maybe every other week, I'll test something out and I'll just go screw it. I'm testing this one and then one will win. And then I'll test that one again. And it's just, a, it's constant improvement. Um, so create ad groups with relevant keywords in the copy being used. So if you have a bunch of different things that you're going after, you got to think of the variations of that keyword and then make ad groups for that so that you can have specific copy for that. So, um, as usual, my dog's here. So golden retriever puppy toys um, versus golden retriever squeak toys. I might want to have an ad group for more general uh, puppy toys and then an ad group for more general squeak related toys and make sure that I use the word squeak in there. Um, so breaking ad groups into, I have my notes here, so bear with me. Break, breaking ad groups into discovery keywords with broad, okay, so. So we created those ad groups, right? So let's do um, Golden Retriever Squeak Toys. And that what I'm gonna do is those keywords that are that are kind of more broad, I'm gonna keep that in their own separate ad group of a broad and phrase. I like to keep the broad and phrase together. It's who I am. Um, once I see that one of those specific search terms keeps showing up and is doing well, I will negate it in that broad and phrase match ad group, bring it into an exact match, run it there and jack that bit up. If it starts to do really well, I'll make my own campaign, put that ad group into that campaign of like success ad groups and jack that budget up so that I have room to run. Um, Cause the broad and phrase you'll usually want to limit just in case you get a bunch of crap in there. Um, use everything you have available, every friggin' thing in there. I go in there sometimes, I go, why didn't you use this? There's ad extensions. So, you know, call outs and, and uh, call extensions and, any other option you can have all the e-commerce sellers you now have the option to put like your price into the search um there's like a little box that comes under 
the uh, description with some of your products and I think it shows like three or four and it can actually swipe and you can actually put your price in there now. Oh, so the responsive and dynamic ads, uh, the dynamic ones work similar to shopping. So you kind of, with shopping, you give them a product and then keywords just kind of show up and you negate them. In dynamic ads for search terms, it's the same thing. You give them a URL and it shows for what it thinks you need to show for and then you start to negate them. So it's the same process, test it. There's been a lot of times where I've had great success with those and there's been times where I haven't. The uh, responsive ones are great. I always have success with those. That is basically, you write like 15 different titles and 15 different descriptions and Google just kind of picks whichever one it thinks is gonna work the best based on whatever you're targeting. Then, so, oh, okay. So specifically for e-commerce sellers, use your shopping uh, data that you have, your shop, your shopping ads. So. You'll, you'll run your shopping ads, right? You're always gonna narrow it down to whichever keywords are doing the best. Once you figure out those keywords that are probably in your low um, priority campaign, take those keywords, put them into a search group, uh, a search ad, and create a search ad with that so that you're owning the first spot on the shopping ads, but then you're also owning the first, shot, uh, first spot for the search ads. If you're owning the first spot for shopping ads, a lot of people are like, why do I need to also do it for search ads? Not everyone uses those. Um, some people aren't as visual as you would think. You'll actually see, um, and I've had this happen a lot, where the search ads will actually end up doing better than the shopping ads if you do that. And you just want to own as much real estate as you can. Then bidding. I prefer to use CPC enhanced, um, so where they fluctuate the bid based on what they think is gonna work well. Um, I'm not a fan of conversion uh, targeting or target CPA or anything like that. I don't like any of those. I don't have enough control. I check my search and my shopping ads on a daily basis and go through and clean out any uh, keywords that I don't want. So when I'm that uh, controlled on what I'm doing, I don't need Google's help with the conversion thing, and I also find that I've not really had much success with it. Doesn't mean you won't. You can obviously try it, but I've had more success with the CPC. Then uh, the, the last, so last thing I wanted to mention was search ads work for everyone. I've heard so many times people will tell me like, "Oh, search ads don't work for us. We only work well with shopping ads or something like that." You're sending, you're not testing enough. You're not sending them the right landing page. You're not thinking about where that person is when they're shopping. So my suggestion would be you definitely need to continue trying search ads until you can figure it out. Um, so obviously I wanna feature a tool. Uh, today I'm gonna to feature Uber Suggest. so shout out to Neil Patel for that. I love Uber Suggest. it is amazing because you can just plug in your competitor's uh, URL and get all the keywords that they rank for, all their top pages, all that kind of stuff. Nine times out of 10, I'll just take that URL, drop it into Uber Suggest, and go give me all those keywords and I'll just go run a bit against them. But that is all I have for today. So rate, review, subscribe, all that fun stuff. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for tuning in to the Ecom Show. Head over to ecomshow.com to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or on the Blue Tusker YouTube channel. The Ecom Show is brought to you by Blue Tusker, a full-service digital marketing company specifically for e-commerce sellers looking to accelerate their growth. Go to bluetusker.com now for more information. Make sure to tune in next week for another amazing episode of The Ecom Show.